So welcome everybody uh, to this Thursday night, our double header for uh, February, but uh, we won't get into all that right now. But uh, I want to really thank Doug Gladstone for uh, uh, agreeing to speak tonight uh, about his book, A Bitter Cup of Coffee. Uh, I had seen that book uh, flying around on uh, Amazon and other book sites, especially on baseball book sites. And I have been intrigued with it. And I always had it in the back of my mind that I would catch up with it. But I'm glad that Doug has caught up with us. Now, also, um, just a few days ago, uh, Doug had mentioned uh, that he could get Tom Johnson to come along, too. And that was really intriguing as well, because he's a person who can really tell us what it is all about, uh, uh, you know, a real live um, example of, of what a bitter cup of coffee is about. And so I'm very intrigued to hear what they have to say. And I don't want to take up any more of their time because I want them to get into the story right away. So uh, why don't we have Doug start and then you can bring uh, Tom in up to pitch. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, this time, Tom. Tom is going to relieve me. <laughs> Normally, it would be the other way around. Uh, but thank you very much, uh, Joanne. Thank you, Bill. Thank the entire Boston chapter of Saber for permitting me or affording me the opportunity uh, to make this presentation, so I could help raise the consciousness of individuals uh, about this issue. Uh, so back in 2009, I was sitting on the couch with my wife and thinking about what type of story I wanted to tell because I had just begun freelancing. And the only thing I remember was that it was the 40th anniversary of the night on July 9th, 1969, when a little known rookie unheralded named Jimmy Qualls uh, lined a clean single into left field to break up Tom Seaver's attempt at a perfect game. And I said, gee, that'd be fun. I could do a where are they now type of feature for Baseball Digest. And that ultimately came out in August of that year. But in speaking to Jimmy, uh, he very innocuously, very casually, like we're all talking now, mentioned, you know, Doug had a good career in the show. I wish it was longer. The only thing I'm really PO'd about is that I don't get a pension. I said, well, what, what are you talking about? I, I thought everyone gets a pension. Now, in terms of transparency, you have to understand, I work for a public retirement system um, in New York. So I know a little bit about vesting and pension requirements. And Jimmy said, to me, well, uh, I got phased out of pensions, pension eligibility in 1980, and let's leave it at that. So I basically did some research. Um, as maybe some of you do or do not know, in order to avert a threatened 1980 Memorial Day weekend walkout by the players, MLB. Um, made the following sweetheart offer to Marvin Miller and Don Fear uh, representing the union. Going forward, all a post-1980 <clears throat> player would need to be eligible to buy into the league's premium health insurance plan was one game of one game day of service. It had been 43 game days. And all a post-1980 player would need for a benefit allowance was 43 game days of service. And at that time, the threshold was four years to be vested in a pension plan. Um, the problem was, as I've been railing ever since, um, the union failed to insist on retroactivity for all those players like Pastor Tom Johnson, who had more than 43 game days, but less than four years of service. Uh, an MLB retiree can receive a pension of up to $265,000. Um, Tom doesn't. For his time in the game, um, 
for every 43 game days he was on a roster, he gets the infinitesimal amount of $718.75. And that's up to $11,500. Mind you, that wasn't the way it always was. Michael Weiner and uh, Commissioner Manfred, when he was the human relations director, and Commissioner Bud Selig at the time, agreed on uh, $625 for every 43 game days you were on an active roster, up to $10,000 a year. And this was only amended, if you recall, last year during the um, contract uh, negotiations with the CBA um, to finalize a new five-year agreement between the union and the league. Uh, I don't know if Tony Clark didn't realize what he was doing, but suddenly the men like Tom got this extraordinary 15% raise. Um, of course, I, I say that in air italics because <clears throat> they, they thought nothing of, of giving themselves a 23.8% raise. The average, the minimum uh, that a bench player can get, the last man riding the pines, is went up from 565 thousand to seven hundred thousand dollars so it's been my contention um, folks that and only because we're with the boston chapter now i'll single out a couple of uh famous boston red sox men like carmen fanzone who never made more than thirty two thousand five hundred dollars or pitchers jim wright his, his salary both years he played for the sox was twenty one thousand and Steve Barr, his rookie salary with, with Boston was $15,000, and his final year with Rangers was $19,000. All of these men, they laid the groundwork. They endured labor uh, strikes, and they went without paychecks. Also that in free agency, um, a outfielder like Masaki, Ma, I don't even know how to pronounce the gentleman's name, Masataki Yoshida, who's never played a lick in the major leagues, he could sign a five-year, $90 million contract to play for the Red Sox. And he got this deal because he was a 29-year-old star for the Oryx Buffaloes in Japan. So my point is, if... If, if I or Bill Nolan came up on August 15th and stayed on the roster for essentially 43 game days till October 1st, we're going to get a pension. It may not be a big pension um, because you have to remember, you have to factor in such things as years of service and final average salary. But according to no less than Steve Rogers, the pension liaison to Tony Clark and Steve Rogers and the late Sal Bando, or respectively the NL and AL player reps who sold their band of brothers under the bus um, back in 1980. According to Steve Rogers, if you do nothing else and you come up from August 15th and stay on a roster till October 1, um, and that's all you do in your baseball career. When you turn 62, you can get a pension. Uh, it's not going to be a big pension, but it's going to be one for $4,000 a year that you can pass on to your designated beneficiary, like your widow, your child, whomever. Meanwhile, a guy like Tom Johnson, who has done yeoman's work in Slovakia, but more to the point, has way more than 43 game days on a roster. 
the money he's getting, it can't be passed on hmm. to a widow or to a child or to his church. And I just find that incredibly small on the part of the union. Now, look, I, I'm not a labor economist. I don't pretend to be one. I don't play one on TV, but it seems to me that today's ballplayers owe a debt of gratitude to the men like Pastor Tom Johnson, to Carmen Fanzone, to David Clyde, uh, to Steve Barr, to Jim Wright. They are the men who laid the groundwork for the success of free agency. And before I introduce Tom, and one, one thing even before I do that, legally, these men don't have a leg to stand on. I, I acknowledge that. Um, morally, however, morally, I find it just horrific that the players union will not go to bat for these men. Um, I just believe that there is a great emphasis on the future generation. You know, I'm a parent. I'm sure a lot of people on the Zoom call are, are parents. And we always care about the future generation as well. We should. They're our future. But let's have a little healthy respect for the men like Pastor Tom Johnson, who came before um, the people like Alex Verdugo or former Red Sox slugger uh, J.D. Martinez. And before I bring on Pastor Tom, um, I just want to tell you, I met a very, I mean, very good friend. He became a very good friend to anyone uh, who perhaps attended Northeastern University. This man, uh, his name will resonate with you. Uh, George Jankowski, who in fact, February 25th marks the third anniversary of his death. Uh, he was in, born in Cambridge and he was a hard hitting catcher who was one of the original six alumni inducted into the Northeastern University Hall of Fame in 1974. This is a man who literally was signed by no less than Connie Mack himself. <laughs> Um, so it was while attending Northeastern that George enlisted in the army in October, 1942. He left for Fort Devens in April, 1943. He sailed to Europe uh, with the 346th Infantry Regiment in the 87th Infantry Division in 1944. He fought in Metz, France, and then moved to Luxembourg where he took part in a little skirmish called the Battle of the Bulge. And for that, for his work during that famous 44 day campaign, he earned the Bronze Star and the Combat Infantry Badge. And in 2014, the French Consul General in Miami awarded him the French Legion of Honor Medal. Why do I talk about that, talk about George? Well, he was a friend, like I said, uh, but you don't hear about his plight. Um, George Jankowski was willing to take a bullet for us and to die for us. And how did the national pastime repay him? With a check of $2,500, which, by the way, as I already alluded, doesn't go to his widow or his children. He died three years ago. That money died with him. Um, and by the way, that was before taxes are taken out. So he played for the Philadelphia A's in 42. He resumed his career in 1949 uh, when he played with the Chicago White Sox. And, you know, when he first got his first ever check in, um, in, April, in August of 2012, you know how he spent it? My hand to God, he used the money to pay for dental work. And that's only fitting because this is a situation that 
to me, really bites. So I've been attempting with, you know, some success. Uh, I'd like there to be more success. That's why I'm doing these calls. Uh, I've been attempting to try and get people to do the right thing. Uh, Perry Barber, I know, is on this conversation. She's been one of my biggest advocates, and I've always respected Perry because, you know, what what am I? I I'm just a, a an activist. Perry, you know, is an activist, but she's a baseball activist trying to get women umpires. Um, I'm just trying to get money for a group of childhood heroes who I had. These were the boyhood heroes of my youth. Um, and I just believe, you know, my cause is a lot of people have made it out to be akin to Man of La Mancha. I'm tilting at windmills. Um, but I hope that with outreach like this, uh, chapters, other Sabre chapters uh, will try and encourage their members to write to Tony Clark. Uh, and, and by the way, I, I say you've got to write to Tony Clark because in a CBA negotiation, the league doesn't have to go to bat at all for these men. It's the union who has to broach this in collective bargaining negotiations. Now, could the league do that? Could they do it unilaterally? Of course they did. Of course they could. Seven years ago, the league um, wrote a, I believe, $10 million check to the Baseball Hall of Fame hmm. for endowment. And I think Bruce Markison of the Hall of Fame uh, is, is on with us. Uh, and he's a, he's a good buddy. Um, but essentially, the 30 owners were saying, we would rather uh, not support flesh and blood retirees. We would rather support um, exhibitions and museum artifacts than flesh and blood retirees like Tom Johnson. So I don't think enough people know about this issue. I'm going to keep earning my moniker of Public Enemy 1A um, at the Union. I thank you for this time. And ladies and gentlemen, at this time, oh, one last person. Uh, Max, if Max is on this call, Max Efgen uh, wrote a bio of Tom Bruno for Sabre. And he didn't know anything about this issue. And next to me um, and Sabre's Rod Nelson, I've got to believe that Max um, has become one of the more ardent uh, individuals supporting this cause. And by the way, it doesn't take a lot to make me go away. Uh, would I like these men to be retroactively restored into pension coverage as legal? Yes. Uh, would it break the bank? Of course it would. Um, all I've ever called for is a straight $10,000 a man. And for a finite time, let the widows and designated beneficiaries receive this bone so it doesn't become a hardship on them when their spouse passes on. Because this is the final thing before I introduce Tom. Uh, because in the grand economy, of this great game of the national pastime. If you're gonna tell me that the union can't afford to go without $5.15 million a year, that's a sad commentary. Hmm. It really is. That's chump change in the big picture of, of this game. So without any further ado, I'm gonna bring on one of the individuals who, um, who is personally affected by this. Uh, I've written extensively about Pastor Tom Johnson. Um, he's the chief pastor of a church in Maple Grove, Minnesota. He is a hometown boy. He 
got to pitch for his hometown team, the Minnesota Twins. Um, and he hasn't let baseball define him. Um, he has gone on, I think every four months, he goes, he runs a, uh, a sorely needed nonprofit in Slovakia um, called Good Sports International, uh, where he tries to um, upgrade reading and writing and uh, people's lives in that country. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to zip my lip right now. And if there are any questions later on, I'll gladly answer them. Um, but it gives me, it is an honor. It gives me great pleasure at introducing now my friend, Pastor Tom Johnson. Dogs that, are excited. Is, is that your dog, Doug? That is my dog, Tom. Okay, yeah. And my dog reacted, so. <laughs> <laughs> so did mine. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, well, first of all, um, let me let me just uh, thank Doug for doing something he didn't have to do and and a, and a fight that he didn't have to pick. Um, and yes, he he is a he has turned himself into a pain in the ass as far as uh, baseball is concerned, um, but I think in a good way. And um, there are you know I, I'm I'm one of those players that. Um, I was released in 1979 because I had a torn rotator cuff. I got, um, um, I tell the story now and in, in light of baseball today, it's almost unbelievable. But um, my in my 78 season, which was my last full season in the major leagues, um, I had entered spring training with a sore shoulder and I was having some difficulty. I'd had a good year the year before and had signed a, a contract, which at that time was supposed to be a lot of money um, well, it was a lot of money. It was 93,000, 92, five, something like that. And, um, so I felt the pressure of, of performing as the closer for the twins and it wasn't going very well. My shoulder was, was bothering me. And there were some other physical issues that went along with their attempt to treat it. Um, but I, I ended up getting a cortisone shot or a couple of cortisone shots in my shoulder. And I was told by the team doctor not to go on the 10 day road trip we were going on. And our manager which I won't mention his name. Um, I, I have good and bad experiences with that manager, but but he said, no, you're going on the trip with us. And four days later, I was in a game in Texas. And then we went to Oakland and um, I pitched I pitched four innings in, in extra innings in, in Oakland. It was either four innings and five innings or five innings and four innings, but I pitched four innings one night and I came back and pitched five innings the next. And when I got home, my arm was really killing me and they did an arthrogram said there's no rotate there's no tear in the rotator cuff so rehab twins picked up mike marshall many of you know mike marshall um iron mike and uh mike as whatever you think of mike um i have nothing but high regard for him he became my physical therapist and he worked me through to where i actually got activated at the end of the season thinking that i didn't have a rotator cuff tear but i did because they misdiagnosed the arthrogram that they took in june but I was active again and, and ended up having rotator cuff surgery. Um, that ended my career because at that time they didn't do arthroscopic surgery with the rotator cuff. They had to do the, the whole, take the deltoid muscle, muscle off and pull it all apart and put it back together. And, and I just, I, I didn't really have enough time uh, to, to, to uh, get back and, and all of that. But that was time for me to leave baseball. But I was so excited when the basic agreement was signed in 1980, because up to that point, every uh, improvement to the, the pension plan was retroactive. And I just assumed that this one would be retroactive. And as I understand it, Marvin Miller to his dying day said the biggest regret he had was that he left all of us in the dust. And he did. Um, um, my understanding, I was just interviewed by a, a Fox 9 sports guy who just happened to show up at my house with a camera. And uh, he had done the research on what my pension would be if I had played one day after 1980. And uh, instead of $8,500 before taxes, I would have an $85,000 a year pension that would go to my wife and, and my, um, my kids. So that's the difference between one day and one year. And so I bumped up right against the deadline 
Um, I was part of the lockout in, 19, in eight, uh, 1976. It cost me time in the major leagues because I was, I was, we had two weeks of spring training and we had a new manager by the name of Gene Mock. And I, I never pitched in spring training. He never got a chance to see me pitch. So I went to AAA for a couple of months before I earned my way back to the big leagues. Um, so what, what I'm here to say and represent us as players, and I think Doug can, Doug can underscore this, and that is as athletes who made it to the major leagues, however that happened and however long we stayed, um, we had a mentality. There's a common mentality among athletes that, that succeed in us in any sport. And that is, you don't look back, you look forward, whatever the obstacles are, you overcome them, you work through them. Um, you don't whine, you don't complain and you don't place a value on that. Um, so when it comes to guys like myself, um, we don't complain. We, we don't have a voice. And so when Doug came along and, and, and I knew about this all those years, when Doug came along and gave a voice to us, it was like a, a breath of fresh air that somebody actually understood the situation we were in and cared about it and was in a position to give us a voice. So I, I'm really grateful to Doug. Um, you know, I, as far as myself is concerned, I, I, I had a great career and there's wonderful experiences that I've had with the Minnesota Twins organization. They've been so good to us. And, and before they even started filming this segment that they did last week, I, I wanted to make sure they understood that, that this is nothing against the twins. The twins have been nothing but kind and gracious to me and, and all of us alumni. I never feel like I'm one of those non-vested alumni. They, they, they include me in various things that are going on. Let me know when there's things happening and they couldn't be more kind and gracious to me. Um, but this uh, pension thing, it is a little bit hard to swallow. Tony Oliva um, and I go back a long way. We were teammates. Um, Tony actually was significantly instrumental. You guys might appreciate this story. Significantly instrumental in my first major league game. I got called up uh, by the Twins the end of the season, 74. I came up from double A, which at that time, I hadn't heard of anybody coming up from double A. So I was totally shocked when they brought me up. And yeah. a few days later, I'm in a game against the White Sox in the 14th inning. And uh, I gave up an unearned run in the 14th. And we go into the we go into the bottom of the 14th. We're playing at home. It's cold. It's September. There's about five, 500 people in the stands. Half of them are my family. And and nobody, no, everybody wants the game to be over. They're, it's they want to go home. And uh, so we're we get that we get a man on first and two out. And uh Frank Quillis, he was the manager. Then he looks down the bench at Tony Oliva and Tony was at the tail of end of his career with his bad knees and everything. And he asked Tony to pinch hit. And uh, I know a few Spanish words and, uh, and Tony used a few of them. And uh, he walked to the end of the bench, picked up a bat to go up against the pitcher he liked to face least by the name of Terry Forster, who was throwing smoke and probably upper nineties back then and Tony's left-handed and Forster's left-handed and Tony felt, you know, it's like, okay, let's get this over with. And uh, he proceeds to hit a ball just short of a home run down the left field line off the foul pole into the corner. Tony hobbles into second base, the runner scores and everybody in the stands is pissed. Mm -hmm. So, um, but for me, it meant I got to pitch another inning. I went out through a one, two, three inning and we scored in the bottom of the 15th and I won the game. So Tony and I go back and yeah, and Tony, um, Tony and I go back and, and he's, he's been advocating for me. Like I was advocating for him to be in the hall of fame. And we kind of, we kind of go back and forth on this deal. He always asks me how I'm doing. I'm asking how he's doing. Now I know how he's doing. I was in Cooperstown when he was inducted. I told him I wouldn't miss it for the world. Um, but, but Tony and I were at a meeting that was put on by the alumni association. It gives you a little bit of an idea of the attitude and I don't understand it. I'll never understand it till the day I die. Um, but there was some guy up there and Steve Rogers was in the room, but there was some guy up there uh, who was kind of moderating the thing. And Tony raised the question of what about these guys pointing to me and a couple other guys in the room and uh, who, who don't have a pension? What, what are the players association doing for these guys? And I'll never forget what this guy said. Uh, he, he, I don't know who he was, but I'm sure he's making a whole lot more money than I am. And he says, uh, they should be just grateful for what they got. And, uh, and I just said out loud, I can't believe you just said that. Uh, 
So this was the attitude of the of of the alumni association that supposedly or the players association supposedly representing me, who I guess don't really matter in their minds and their eyes um, because they've got it good. And and I guess there's a, a a story in that, probably a few parables that speak to that. But it it's um, uh, it's something that we've been up against, and we're not the kind of people that are going to complain. So we're not going to be raising the issue. I think David Clyde did for a while and he got shut up pretty quickly, but um, David was in a position to do so because he had kind of a bigger platform than a lot of us do. Um, I think that's about all I, I have to say. Um, yes, I have gone on I, uh, to clarify a little bit of what Doug's saying. Um, my wife and I moved to Slovakia uh, in, 19, in 2005 and we were there for 12 years and then grandkids started coming along. We've transitioned back, but my, mainly because we have a staff that are running two youth centers over there. What we're doing over there is we're running a basically think boys and girls club we've got two sites and and um and and you know with the you know i i don't know i with with additional resources we could plant half a dozen more um and so we're continually raising support to just basically pay our pay the salary of our staff and um and so i'll be going back over this summer i i don't go every four months unfortunately i'm doing a lot of work here stateside now and um and actually, as I'm as I'm talking to you guys in the background is a district playoff game that my grandson is playing in in hockey. So uh, um, and I think it's zero zero. So um, but yeah, that's that's what we've been doing lately. We're, we're back here in the States. I, I've been fortunate enough to be welcomed back to a role on the staff of the church that I, I used to be at before we left for Slovakia. And I I, I like yeah, I, I like the term coach better than pastor. Um, but I think they're a lot similar. So that that's a little bit of who I am. Hmm? Oh, yes, one more thing. <clears throat> and uh, she's sitting over here. And I, I don't know if you'd want to hear from her, but maybe the women in the crowd would. Um, uh, baseball was a lot different. You know, Doug talks about walking picket lines and, you know, lockouts and all of that. And that was part of it. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you what baseball was like uh, when I was playing. Um, when I came up, the minimum salary was $12,000 a year. Um, and we had to work jobs in the off season to support our families. And the attitude, the attitude has changed a lot. And I'm grateful for that. But when our first child was born, I was playing in double A ball. And uh, we had moved, we moved 36 times our first nine years of marriage, and that's moving everything you have and relocating. So my wife is my hero. But when we had, we're having our first child, it was scheduled to be delivered. I mean, it was due on, in August. And I come back from a road trip in May, and she can't settle down after that we play our home game. And then I, we go to, she can't settle down. We take her into the hospital, and she delivers 45 minutes after we arrive with twins. Hmm. And uh, we didn't know we were having twins. And the-, the How appropriate. Yeah. You are a twin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, unfortunately, the first one who was born didn't make it. He, he yeah. died an hour after he was born. And, right. uh, and, and the other one was fighting for his life and did for quite a while. And um, I went, I, after Debbie got, got settled down and we kind of worked through that, or, you know, you don't work through it, but after we dealt with it, I went to the- I went to the game that night and pitched in the game. And then we got up in the morning and went to the mortuary to dispose of the dispose of our child and then played in the game the next night. And if you think that was just the minor leagues, I, in the major oh. leagues in 77, when I was having a great year, um, my, my wife was induced with our second child. She had complications and uh, had to have a, an emergency C-section. And that happened around six o'clock in the evening. Um, the baby was born shortly after that. Debbie was okay. Um, I got in the car, drove to the ballpark, and pitched the last two games of the two innings of the game and got a save. Um, 
And so they put up on the screen that, that I'd had a baby and everybody's cheering. Um, so when I, when I watch these guys who miss the opening day or they, they miss a playoff game because of, they're with their wife having a child, you know, my wife and I are grateful for that they had that opportunity, wish we had. And so some of this is, some of this is, um, you know, a lot of us have gone on and we've had a good life and we've had a successful career. Some have not, but there feels to, to me to be something um, for people like my roommate when I first got up to the big leagues, Jim Hughes, or guys that I know here from Minnesota and, and Pennsylvania, like Bob Gorinsky and Mike Pepping and Greg Thayer and Gary Serum and other guys I know, um, some of whom have done okay and some of whom have not. But but none of us ever really made any money in baseball and and endured a, a lot of challenges along the way. So you know that's not to pat me on, myself on the back. It's to elevate the you know my wife, who's like I said, my hero. Um, uh, we're married because she was willing to put up with some stuff that a lot of other people wouldn't. Um, but it was just a different time, and that was the I I I think it's important to remind people that that was that was the life that. We chose, we, we liked it, we loved it. It was an honor, it was a privilege to play and to get to the big leagues was beyond anything I could have even dreamed about. Um, so I'm grateful. And you know, you know, I'm conflicted, I guess you'd say. Yeah. I'm really grateful for the experience I had, but, but I, I recognize that there, as Doug has said, there is a kind of an injustice that's been done, even if it's not illegal. And there's a declining number of, of you, Doug. How, what's the figure these days, more or less? Of the fi the figure of um, that we ha see. I have to qualify. Around 500 or so, right? It's 515 men who have more than 43 game days on a roster, but less than four years. Then, yeah. thank you, thanks to Max, the aforementioned Max Efgen, uh and Rod Nelson, we've also figured out that there's roughly 185 people who have less than 43 game days who don't get any amount of money. Um, the, the Purple Heart winner, um, they trotted him out, the Los Angeles Dodgers did in 2017. Uh, they trotted him out for game two uh, of the 2017 World Series. I'm trying to remember his name, but he's one of those individuals who has less than 43 game mm -hmm. days. Um, he doesn't get a dime. He doesn't get a dime. The men like Tom, at least they get something. But and And I just feel that it's a matter of equity. Um, most of the players, most of the current rank and file do not know about this issue. Right. Absolutely, they do not know. The player reps do not know because, and, and I'll go one further, the union executive committee members don't know. Tony Rogers, Tony Clark rather, and Steve Rogers, wow, that's a two-headed hydra. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Tony Clark and Steve Rogers do not tell them. I don't know why. Do you honestly think that a person making, and I think the average salary is $3.7 million these days, do you honestly think that someone um, like, you know, Verdugo is going to care if the union gives back $5.15 million to the men like Tom Johnson and Carmen Fanzone and David Clyde, I don't think they're going to care. Um, do, you know, do you know what the overall disbursement on an annual basis is for the union, for all the sum of all the pensions together? I do, not, out? I do not know that. And, and here's the problem. Uh, it's got to be a small percentage of that that would be so what exactly talking, it would be a small percentage of it but yeah thank you paul ember roy gleason is the person yeah. i'm talking about uh, or i was so thank you mr ember um one of the things that is so just infuriating is that neither the union nor the alumni association dan foster 
uh, worked for MLB Advanced Media uh, for many years. And he, of course, is the executive director. He's not rocking the boat. Um, Clark and Rogers are not rocking the boat. They are not going to furnish, even on a FOIL request, they are not going to furnish any journalist um, with the information of how many men are actually affected. I've been saying, Max, myself, and Rod have been saying 515. Um, and that's only because when my book initially came out, um, the reason why it's called, uh, uh, what is it called? A Bitter Cup of Coffee, <laughs> How MLB and the Players Association um, through a curve or through a change to uh, 700 part. I don't even know what the hell my book is called anymore after all these years. <laughs> who's, but, the, who's the author? Yeah, some guy named Brian <laughs> uh, But I know that we were off by 20. The official number, David Clyde got an official look at this list and we were only off by 20. Um, MLB said 705, so I must have said something like uh, 695 or 685. Um, and we've been, Max and Rod, Nelson and myself, have been every time one of these poor souls kicks the bucket, um, you know, it's like the Queen song, another one bites the dust. And we've been checking it off. And we've, within all our powers, we believe that there are only 515 um, left in lieu of those individuals like uh, Roy Nelson, the Purple Heart winner, who don't even get one blessed penny. I was really pleased myself to uh, have the opportunity to interview George Jankowski in 2019. And I wrote his biography for Sabre. It's on the Sabre website. And, uh, so, yeah, Can I uh, ask a question? Um, uh, thank you both gentlemen for, for the, the great uh, talk. Um, and I'm really sorry that I made that very poor joke, Tom. I did not know the circumstances That's fine. of your children. Um, but I wanted to ask, and it might seem like an ignorant question, but it seems like there are some big name people that seem, you know, I've met some of them and I'm sure others have, that seem to have a good heart when it comes to stuff like this uh, among the former major league crowd. I mean, thinking of a Pedro, for instance. I mean, has there been an attempt by you gentlemen to try to, you know, get a guy like that who has a huge stage on the MLB network and other places to go to bat for uh, these gentlemen? Because it just, it just seems like that kind of a voice would be hard for guys like Tony Clark to just ignore. Well, let, let me just tell you this, if, if I could, before Pastor Tom takes over and relieves me, no pun intended. Uh, I, on Christmas day, two years ago, managed to have a conversation with Dave Winfield, the Hall of Famer. Um, and Dave Winfield, by the way, is now making three hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars as uh, Tony Clark's special aide. And I said, you know, uh, seems to me, uh, Mr. Winfield, uh, you went to bat for Negro Leaguers, and I'm not trying to, you know, make an analogy here, but if you remember, there was a mock draft held by Major League Baseball back in 2006, coordinated by Dave Winfield, uh, in which some 30 Negro leaguers got $10,000 each. Uh, they were drafted by the various clubs. It was a great publicity stunt. Um, and Dave Winfield said, Mr. Gladstone, my man, you keep doing what you keep doing and I'll keep doing what I'll keep doing. There, there is no one truly, who is willing to rock the boat. Um, I spoke to a former member of the union committee, of the executive committee last year, who swears on a stack of Bibles. I had no idea this was going on. 
and he was a player's rep. He's no longer a member of the union executive board. I'm not going to tell you who that is, but he went to Rogers. And it is my opinion that the only reason, the only reason the union gave these men an extra bump of 15% was that this former union executive committee member um, went to Steve Rogers. Because, you know, who's writing about this? Tell me what major national columnist is writing about this issue. Uh, Bill Madden, the Pulitzer Prize winner, pardon me, the J.J. Spink uh, Award winner from the Hall of Fame, he writes about it. Um, but who's writing about it at the Boston Globe or the Herald or the Detroit Free Press or the Los Angeles Times? You know, uh, I, I don't want to speak ill of people, but I contacted Helene Elliott. Um, and she said, well, I went to one of my colleagues uh, and they said, why do you want to waste your time on this? It's a non-issue. See, as a former journalist, it's all about access. I can't prove this, but I believe with my heart after 12 years of doing this, that anyone in the fourth estate who is going to broach this issue does so risking their press credentials being taken away. Now, that might seem, Doug, you don't know what you're talking about. That's even goofy for you. <laughs> but tell me why respected people like Bill Plaschke of the Los Angeles Times and Mitch Album of the Detroit Free Press don't write about this. I've got to believe that to a greater or lesser extent, it does have to do with access and they just don't want to rock the boat. You know, journalism is, is uh, it's like the wolf pack. When everyone gangs up on a story, they all run with it. But you're going to be the lone wolf are you going to be the person to take on MLB and the union? I don't think so. Well, I, I mean, I kind of agree. That's why I mentioned the player thinking a guy who grew up from nothing and is so untouchable in terms of his popularity. You know, I just threw that name out there as Pedro, but sure. you know, I, I agree. It'd be tough to be that journalist to, to want to be that, that guy or gal who does it. I have tweeted. So many people. Um, Marco Gonzalez, who is a player's rep for the Seattle Mariners. I got him one day and he said, hey, man, you know, stop being a troublemaker. I got a Gonzaga game to watch on TV. You know, it's, it's really unfortunate that today's player, either they party they they mirror the party line or they just ill-informed and don't know. Can I ask a question, Doug? Um, this is coming from somebody who serves as a union president in my little school district up here in New Hampshire. So I appreciate um, you being the pain in the ass because I enjoy that role as well. Um, I, I say you you never realize how despicable somebody is until you get into contract negotiations. So I appreciate what Tom <laughs> said about that as well. Um, so my question following on Saul is um, not just journalists. Have you reached out to somebody in Congress? For instance, in the past year, we've had stories of Bernie Sanders and Chuck Grassley reaching across the aisle talking about baseball's antitrust exemption, looking at minor leaguers pay and the situations of, of minor league ball. Um, and you mentioned historically there was a push for Negro League pensions and things like that. Has there been any attempts to do that? Well, somebody like Bernie Sanders, who has nothing to lose as far as reputation and would take on, I would think, something like that or um, like that. Or 
is this, would this, just a crazy idea, would this in court stand up as an unfair labor practice because of the fact that modern players are being treated so much differently based on Tom's analogy of one day on one side of 1980? I mean, that's, and I don't know about that, but I'm just curious. Uh, number one, to answer your first question first, uh, I've reached out, yes, to uh, Chuck Schumer, you know, the speaker of, of the Senate, the majority leader of the Senate, pardon me. Um, and all I hear are crickets. Um, in terms of uh, legal precedent, uh, you know, this was a lawsuit back in 2004 that got thrown out by the state Supreme Court in California because the, um, the plaintiff's attorney at the time um, tried to invoke Title IX. Um, he tried to say, and, and again, you know, we're living in a, uh, at a time where we've had uh, the first African-American president, the first African-American vice president. Um, this lawyer made the case that men like Tom and others were being unfairly treated um, because they were Caucasian um, and Negro leaguers were getting health insurance and Negro leaguers were getting pensions that MLB unilaterally gave them um, in 1997. Um, the problem with that argument, it doesn't recognize the fact that uh, people like Aaron Pointer, the great diversity champion um, who played uh, with the Houston Colt 45 and then the Houston Astros, and then went on uh, to uh, become an NFL referee, uh, and he's an NAACP winner, he's part of this cohort. So legally, you know, that argument was never going to fly, never at all. Um, you know, I just believe that where you win this battle is on the front lines. We had Melissa Ludke, I saw. She was on know, for a while, yeah. Yeah, I don't know who she um, is writing for these days, but I have pitched her plenty of time and again, nothing. You know, I really believe this is the best thing people can do, uh, particularly the Boston chapter. I mean, Dan Shaughnessy, I communicate with him all the time, and he's always said this is a very worthwhile cause. I told him about this Zoom meeting. Nothing. How about Steve Buckley at the Athletic? Yeah, I've reached, I've reached out to Steve now that he's with the Athletic. Um, he, when he was with, I think, uh, the Globe. He was interested in this, but uh, the Athletic um, doesn't seem to be interested in it either. Gabrielle Starr of the Boston Herald is their new uh, Red Sox beat writer. She is quite a fierce young voice in um, that circle. It yep. might be somebody to contact. She is you know, it may, by all means, Bruce, if you want to, I don't care. My ego isn't that grand that um, I need it to be stroked all the time. If you want to do the reaching out, uh, that is fine for me. Um, I, I know this. The former uh, Boston Herald guy, Jason Mastro Donato. Yeah. He's now with the East Bay News and Bud Jirasi. Uh, Bud Jirasi, the executive sports editor there, just assigned him the story about Les Kane. Everyone remembers Sugar Kane? Sugar Kane um, was the guy who won a workers' compensation case against the Detroit Tigers because Billy Martin misused him. And for the longest of time, he was getting the princely sum of $111 a, a week from the, uh, from the Tigers. Uh, but Les Kane is one of these guys. So 
I've pitched Jason Masco Donato plenty of times when he was with the Boston Herald. And I told that to, uh, to Bud. He said, well, you know, I'm the executive editor and he'll listen to me. So we'll see how it goes. I just want to say also that uh, I was wondering as if uh, Tom could identify this good looking guy right here. Huh. I don't know if you can see that, Tom. Yeah, I've seen a few of those over the years. Have you seen this guy yeah. before? That's yeah. Your, that's your 1976 Tops card, my friend. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a few, but, um, you know, I, I, I think I don't know what goes on in the world of journalism. That's not my that's not my area of expertise. But uh, as any good journalist, they're going to listen to Doug. They're going to they're going to research the story, and they're going to going to going to go to the players' association. They're going to go to the alumni association. And they're going to talk to them. And whether or not whether or not it's a matter of access and that, that gets denied, or they just get the party line of whatever. Um, like this guy that was at the meeting I was at who said they should just be happy for what they got. Um, I mean, if that's, if, if that's the attitude of the, you know, this was, this was not a former player. This was just some guy who was hosting the meeting. Steve Rogers was in the back, but this guy doesn't know anything about it other than what he's hearing from Steve Rogers and Tony Clark. So he's just puppeting whatever, whatever the party line is. And, and if a writer is going to go and, and, hear what whatever animosity or whatever irritation or whatever they ha they, they 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 dish out um and and they could jeopardize their access i don't know if that's going on but and and how much that plays a part um but again they're um i i don't think it's a real attractive story to the general public and you know maybe it is but i don't know how it gets there doug has certainly tried over the years i think if you make it personal i want to make sure we let perry ask her question but yeah. if you if you make it personal i mean like your story that you told tom of your wife's labors and i mean and the the purple heart you know the guy at the battle of the bulge i mean those are the kind of you know, those are the kind of stories that I think would resonate, like use one or two guys as the examples. But anyway, Perry, why don't you go ahead? Yes. Hi, Doug. So great to hear you talk about this. And we are your megaphones. Uh, we're just carrying on the work that you do and Max and everybody. And it's a privilege to um, be a part of this effort. Um, Pastor Tom, you are a man of God, and I so appreciate and am in in. Um, I just admire your faith in the better angels of human nature. But I have been around several of the Detroit Tigers that are among that group: um, John Warden and Ike Blessett, and. Uh, it, it, if you want to hear a story about why you should not believe that Marvin Miller ever had a regret about leaving those players out of the agreement when he wrote it and worked on it, or his immediate descendant, Donald Fear, you should talk to John Warden and, and ask him to tell you a story about what Don Fear, what his comment was when asked how he felt about helping those players. It is pretty disgusting and i'm going to hell so i don't you know care about saying that about somebody else um but like i said i i think your faith in in uh marvin miller's intentions is a bit misplaced um the other comment i have is doug I, i'm just curious there are a couple of assistance organizations the baseball assistance team and the um, APBPA, which is in a bit of disarray, and I don't know if they still are supporting minor league baseball players. They did for a long time. But are there any programs to help those ball players that are falling through the cracks in the meantime, until or unless um, this is ever straightened out in that small? group of 500 is offered the ten thousand dollars that you are fighting for for them in the is there any um any do they get any other type of assistance in the meantime doug wound up uh doug can't he with... can't answer right now his his oh. uh, computer ran out of juice he's, oh. trying get, <laughs> he's trying to get back on 
Okay. Well, I'm. I'm. Maybe curious. Tom. Well, maybe I can Tom take has a, an insight on that. Yeah. I, I, go for Max. it, Tom. Max. Well, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, my name is Max Efkin. I'm a Saber member out of Seattle. Um, I've been involved with the Bio Project for a while, um, and I came across this by uh, doing Tom Bruno's bio, uh, much similar to Tom Johnson. Uh, literally was cut on the last day of spring training in 1980. Had he been on the roster for one day, would not this would not be an issue. I wouldn't have got caught up in it. Um, as far as what, uh, just quickly, um, there are very scattered and it's very um, sporadic in terms of okay. help, like specifically Ike Blissett, um, who is just short of the 43 days, um, had uh, the strike in 1972 not happened. Whose career was also ruined by Billy Martin. So. Yes, yeah, actually, and there's some <laughs> several great stories. And as you get to know the people that are helping Ike, um, that there are um, a lot of very good people that are putting in their own time, money, and resources to help Ike get the things that he needs so he can just survive, survive a Detroit winter, survive, you know, uh, and because Ike has done a tremendous amount for his own community in terms of raising, um, you know, getting kids to play baseball, mm -hmm. um, women to play baseball, I mean, just across the board. So, um, you know, he's definitely has a, uh, a calling in his own right, um, but the financial side of the piece is, is not necessarily there. So there are people helping, but it's very piecemeal. Across uh, that's the board. what I thought. It's a patch. Yeah. So, and in terms of like the other angles, like how do we raise awareness and educate? Um, you know, the one thing to keep in mind of these 500 people and why it's not necessarily an exciting story: the average age is 77. All right. Yeah. Um, it's the Doug's youngest. Right. It's just a the way youngest is 63. The oldest is 98, closing in on 99. All right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and you know that in all of them. Like every ball player that's on this list that I've talked to um, sound a lot like Tom in that it's not necessarily just about them. It's about everybody else. It's about those guys that have fallen through the cracks. I've seen players raise GoFundMes or friends of players raise GoFundMes for health care, for surgeries, for all sorts of stuff, uh, which, quite frankly, they shouldn't have to do. Yeah. Um, you know, these aren't players that were... Uh, not highly touted. I mean, one was like a first round draft pick, uh, you know, in the seventies. So, you know, that, you know, today that player would have, would sign a multi-million dollar contract and this would not be a thing. Right. Um, we have been compiling not only the list, trying to keep it current um, of not only the, the, the 515, but also kind of what we call the shortened bidders. Um, and the 178 is the current number right now uh, at bittercupbaseball.com. We're also kind of using that as a website to kind of aggregate um, all the articles that Doug gets published, articles that other people get published. Um, we'll soon have the video of Tom Johnson's uh, interview. There's interviews with Aaron Pointer. Um, and there are just you know, really, unfortunately, just a handful of players because like Tom said, it's not in them to rock the boat, right? Or to complain, really, because it's like just you get it, you know, as far as being an athlete, being a team player. Um, and so the, uh, you know, the main thing is we are kind of going on and about this. And it's like, yeah, it'd be great, like, if I could get to talk to Ken Griffey Jr. about this or even Harold Reynolds. The funny thing about Harold Reynolds is that his brother, Don, is on this list. And so, um, you know, it's one of those things where every player, um, has some sort of connection with yeah, not only with each other, some but, stake in it, but they're that, not that's doing incredible. Anymore. The Harold yeah. Reynolds thing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. Have any of you have been able to talk to Harold? I mean, it'd be hard to argue against it when your own brother's on the list. <laughs> yeah, I know. So I actually have a, um, I'm working on talking to Don. I have a connection, uh, through, uh, my children's school that they're actually related to the Reynolds. So, um, yeah, so uh, it, it sometimes, you know, players aren't necessarily willing to share their story and that sort of thing. But um, it's, uh, you know, it it's hard sometimes for, for guys to kind of, you know, speak up. And uh, so, that, you know, you kind of are fighting that, too. And then also, you know, you know, we're doing a lot on Twitter. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, I'm pretty much tweeting out almost every day. One of these guys has a birthday. Um, mm -hmm. If they pass away, we do a little condolence. Um, you know, kind of card uh, for them. 
uh, as we kind of keep this list current and whatnot. Um, you know, there's two birthdays coming up tomorrow. Uh, one is Mike Sember, who was a college teammate of Steve Rogers. And so there's three college teammates of Steve Rogers who's, who are on this list. Um, they hardly talk from what I understand. Do you have a Facebook uh, page? Uh, do not have a Facebook page right now. Um, we certainly could. Um, we find that Twitter kind of gets the most traction in yeah, the baseball I mean, space. Yeah. But Facebook, you can like write out longer things, you know, it's kind of a yeah. place where yeah, people go for history. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I mean, but you know, so right now, yeah, bittercupbaseball.com, almost every tweet I have about this will end in that uh, a link to that. So um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, you may know a player on this list, they may not have a Sabre bio, um, you know, the more, you know, many hands make light work on this. And, and like Doug said, you know, none of us are having ego about any of this, we would just want to get it resolved. Right. But we're lone wolves howling at the moon, but we're going to be a pack pretty soon. And, you know, I'm a little flea like a gnat, but a swarm of gnats is very annoying. So somebody's going to start paying attention soon. We just got to keep beating this drum. And thank you and Doug so much for doing that, because um, it is not a non-issue. It, it goes to, you know, what Pastor Tom is all about, you know, faith in in the goodness of human nature and the desire to do the right thing, not because it's legally mandatory, but just because that's the right thing to do. So thank you. Clearly, yeah. Boston Sabre Thanks. cares because we had 31 people at eight o'clock yeah. and yes. we have 29 people at nine, nine twenty or nine fifteen, which you know exactly shows people are are very interested. Well, it, 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 as a player, can I just say thank you to each of you that again, not don't necessarily have a dog in the fight, but but are on here and you're interested and you're expressing your support. It feels good to hear you hear you verbalize that. Um, I can throw something out, which I didn't have an opportunity to have a conversation. But um, when I was at Cooperstown looking for somebody else, I ran into uh, on the other side of the fence because he was on he was in the VIP section, uh, Senator Tim Kaine, mm -hmm. and he was there with a uh, um, Kansas City Monarchs jersey and cap because apparently he is on the board of the Negro League Hall of Fame in Kansas City. Ah, so we, we, if anybody has connections with Tim Kaine or know how to reach him, um, he might be someone that, that, that um, at, at least he has an interest in baseball, enough of an interest to, to be at Cooperstown and be wearing a Kansas City Monarchs uh, Buck O'Neill um, jersey. So very interesting. If I may, um, Perry's comment just a minute ago, first off, I don't think there's anybody in or outside of Sabre that is going to consider Perry Barber any sort of a gnat. So <laughs> let's get that out there right now. We love you dearly. It's nice to see you, my friend. Uh, second, <laughs> second off, um, it was mentioned, I think, by Doug, some, and he went quickly on this about some sort of a letter writing program. Correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe Max can help me out or, or Tom um, that this was mentioned. My question would be as, as a chapter lead, is there any sort of a template that was created by any of you who are involved in this to assist those who would like to get involved in something like that to help them? Help yeah, them. I, um, I will tell you this, Bruce, that yes, I created a template years ago and it was used by um, Jim Hutto. Jim Hutto, uh, the former Baltimore Oriole and Philadelphia Philly. Um, and Mr. Hutto, thought that he'd be perfect uh, because as you well know, and if you don't, uh, I'll tell you, uh, <laughs> you know, Brooks Robinson, uh, his former teammate um, was 
the president of the um, uh, alumni uh, board. And now the president is uh, Jim Tomey, the former Philly, Chicago White Sox, yada, yada, yada. Uh, Dave Matchmer, who I don't know if you know uh, Dave. Dave has over 1,350 um, victories to his credit as a minor league manager. Um, uh, he played for the California Angels and uh, the Detroit Tigers. But of course, as you well know, pension credit is not, uh, minor league credit rather, is not pension creditable. And he met Jim Tomey. And this goes to, you know, Coach Johnson's <laughs> point earlier. Uh, I said, Dave, you had him right in the room. You had him right in the room. Why don't you, you know, why didn't you say anything? Oh, I just didn't think it was the right time and place. Um, there is no right time and place for this, particularly when people don't know about the issue. So, Bruce, um, you know, if you want a template, if any of you want a template, I will be more than happy to forward you in concert with Max. Um, something will tailor it to your individual chapter. Now, I was told by no less the executive director of Sabre that, you know, they, they didn't want me talking at their annual convention. Um, because at the time, I think the, the former president, I don't know if there's a new administration, the former president uh, was on Sirius. He had a radio show on Sirius that was in part funded by MLB. It, 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 my whole point is, you know, I don't want to make waves for anybody on Saber if you're not a political organization. You know, I get enough complaints from people on the Facebook site of Sabre who are going to me continuously. These guys didn't earn it. These guys were short the four years. You know, it's just like Dan Foster's comment to Pastor Johnson, uh, you know, a couple of years ago. You're lucky you're getting anything. That, that's completely what Dan Foster has told other individuals. That's why I know that it had to be Dan Foster. Um, so, you know, is, is Sabre a political organization? Do you wanna go um, and advocate for <laughs> these men? Or do you wanna stay, principally what I've been told by Facebook people, um, uh, rather favor people on Facebook, look, we are interested in research and favor metrics and analytics, and this is outside the scope of our purview. So, you know, if you want to write as individuals, that's fine too. That's the way it needs to be because Saber is a nonprofit and is not supposed to be involved in advocacy. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what but, I'm, that, yeah. that doesn't prevent us all from talking about it as we are now and uh, changing, I trading thoughts and ideas and uh, and organizing amongst ourselves as individuals. So, it's great. It's, uh, it's Alec. Can I just say one quick thing? Yeah, please. Um, yeah, actually, I used to work for the uh, state of Rhode Island, and my boss was uh, Seth Magaziner, who just got elected to Congress in Rhode Island. So I'm happy to, um, you know try to connect the dots here and write him a note and you know we're, we're friends so i think he would listen so if somebody could just send me some more information as noted as a private citizen i'm happy to I, i'm sure he'll listen because he cares about labor issues and i wish he liked baseball as much as we all do but i think he would listen so i'm that's I wonderful Alex. thank you happy to help if, if you and again if anyone needs my um uh, email it's pretty simple it's the title of the book a bitter cup of coffee at gmail.com. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me that way. The group that uh, that Max mentioned is would be a good place for everybody to uh, 
to check in on too. Uh, you put the address in the chat, Max, I believe, at least once. Yeah, a, a bitter cup of a, a bitter cup baseball dot com um, yeah. is is kind of the website, and um, I run that. And uh, any articles that you know Doug gets published or anyone else gets published on this, um, we put links there. Um, there are you know uh, also the names of all these players, affected players, are there. We have them broken out by uh, team. Uh, as well. So you can go find every Minnesota twin. You can go find every Boston Red Sox. You can go find, um, you know, so you, it, we try to make it easy so that, you know, people can find people that they may know, may know about. Um, maybe they don't have a Sabre Bio project. And you, yeah, you that's what I was going to say. Cause I, I right. mean, I, I'm involved with Bio Project a lot. And I, it's great looking up some of these folks that don't have a bio. I mean, They'll Steve Barr you. struck me. Steve Barr, I think he might have been with the 75 Sox. Mm -hmm. um, that struck me as somebody that if we were trying to get somebody like a Shaughnessy or a Buckley, like, you know, kind of use the angle of a guy like Steve Barr. And I think there was another Red Sox mentioned. Yeah. Uh, it, Jim Wright, Carmen. Jim Benzo. Wright, right. Listen, 78. I, yeah. I, I've pitched Shaughnessy and, you know, the only person who, who casually he had this Sunday column uh, Nick Cafardo, the late Nick Cafardo, yeah, yeah. he he mentioned Yankowski um, once or twice. Uh, you know, the, the tragedy with, with Steve Barr is that Steve Barr's nephew is a former major leaguer who greatly profited from um, from free agency. Um, uh, he might have pitched in the 2009 World Series for the for the Phillies. I know he definitely was on the Phillies. Um, you know, it is it is just it's always interesting. Um, this person tells one person and another person. You know, the the relationships that I have made in the 12, 13 years I've been doing this, I would not trade for anything um people like max and and people like perry and people like coach johnson um you know they've helped me through some dark moments when i literally like why the hell am i doing this yeah you know why am i spinning my wheels and because you know we all have to take care of of one another it's as simple as that well, Doug, the 15% increase that you mentioned recently, that might itself not have happened had it not been for yourself and, and others. Oh, I'm I'm positive it didn't um it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't reached yeah. out to this union executive for I'm I I'm positive of it. Uh, there's another angle. You know, if you really want to get to Clark and Rogers and, and Bruce Meyer, uh, who's their collective uh bargaining expert interesting um parenthetically uh bruce meyer worked for the nhl under don fear who of course was uh the union um guy um before michael wiener before the late michael wiener god bless him um and you know if anyone has connections with current executive committee members like Jared Cole, Marcus Semyon, Francisco Lindor. Uh, you know, the funny thing is at his press conference um, when he became a Yankee, when they announced his signing, Jared Cole made no bones about it. If any of you recall, he said, I want to thank Kurt Flood and Marvin Miller mm. because without them, I wouldn't be making, you know, this, not, I'm paraphrasing, this insane amount of money. <laughs> and yet, when I have reached out to Jared Cole, like I said earlier, crickets. I've reached out to Francisco Lindor, crickets. Um, I don't know Marcus Semyon, and I don't think he has a Twitter account, but those are just three people three very important people on the union executive committee 
who I'm hoping someone out there has uh, connections to. And it's also about planting the seed too, right? You know, just because you don't get a response right away doesn't mean that it's not out there and germinating. Like, so I've taken an attack where, um, you know, from the executive committee, the compensation committee, uh, emailing their agents and just laying out, hey, this is a case that would not only be good for baseball, but, you know, good for them as well as, you know, just taking care of uh, former union members, former, you know, dues paying members of the organization that they're not representing. Um, and, you know, again, crickets, right? Uh, but also, I'm not expecting anything either. Um, I do have some connections with some media personalities here in Seattle. You think Aaron Pointer would be on TV just about every week? He's not. Um, crickets, you know the the local sh- you know the, the local sports shows. Just you know, again, it's not necessarily a story that um, people really, really want to take on. Um, unfortunately, uh, but that said, you know the fact that. The, still the number of folks here tonight is, you know, it's a, it's a nice starting point, right? So hopefully, um, you know, please take a look at the list. You'll find, you might find someone you know. Um, and, you know, the more that uh, the word gets out there, the you know, it will it will get to the right ears eventually. And somebody will, take, you know, somebody will make bigger noise and, and take care of this. Joe Posnanski. I don't know why I just thought of that name, but I mean, he's such a crusader and kind of universally loved and you know doesn't really have to go into locker rooms to write the kind of stuff he writes seems like he might be a guy that that i don't know if anybody knows joe personally in in this room i mean i know he's been on the saber cast but um and have you been on the saber cast doug and i just didn't happen to hear it and talk uh, no no i have not uh, i've reached out to joe plenty of times again <laughs> crickets uh, I've even contacted his, you know, because people like Mitch Album and and Joe are, you know, they have executive assistants who open their mail and read their email. Um, nothing. Nothing. Can I speak it, to that for just a minute? Sure. Uh, your comment about losing access or fearing losing access even if joe posnanski doesn't have to go into a locker room they still and frankly to be honest with you right now i'm kind of in the same position because as much as i want to advocate for this issue doug and i haven't talked to you about it but um several months ago an organization that is very near and dear to my heart got a huge donation from MLB. So now I'm in the weird position of having to worry, like if I keep pounding the drum for this issue, will MLB think askance of my entire board of directors and withdraw their support for what we're working, uh, this project that we're working on them for? Uh, You know, and I have to consider that now. And I imagine that is a lot of what goes into the fact that nobody is beating the drum for this issue or that they are reluctant to do so because they fear losing their power base, their their access. So I'm just trying to think of a way to get around that. Um, you know what, Perry, if I could, I am I wouldn't worry about it. And look, I, I want to make this very clear. Um, someone once criticized me when I, I earlier alluded to the fact that uh, the Hall of Fame, you know, they wrote him a $10,000, a part of me, $10 million check. Um, and nothing for the men like Tom Johnson. They uh, they'd rather take care of relics uh, rather right. than and, the, and because they know it'll buy them, you know, compliance and silence too. But but here's know? the thing. Here's the thing. You know, I'm very happy that the union writes Michael Weiner's widow uh, a, a, a check to support her work with domestic violence programs. Everyone can coexist. There's enough money to go around. Uh, how do yeah. you pay for this? I mean, I've I've had people, certified P, certified public accountants, tell me, Doug, just one half of one percent of the salary of all of these people who are making at least three point seven million dollars. 
don't yeah. take don't take from the twenty fifth man. You know, don't don't take from the last guy riding the pines. Um, it can be done. Yeah, and it, it shouldn't have to be that complicated. To... But you know, nobody is moving to do it yet, and, and that's why it's important to keep doing what you're doing, and for all of us to. Um, do what we can to amplify your message and uh, stay on board with it. So. Thank you, Perry. Thank you. We're about an hour and a half in, which means we're a little bit over, uh, over the scheduled time. I don't know, has anybody else got some questions, uh, comments, suggestions? I just want to say thank you. I think it's been a, a terrific meeting and, uh, just um, such an important topic, and I hope that we can help in Boston. I mean, we're one of the baseball capitals of America, supposedly. Maybe we can uh, try to make some ways with some of the names that have been bandied about and maybe some others. Hey, by the way, on that wanna, website. Yeah, I just want to mention one other thing. Uh, you know, you talk about a, a hook with, with people like Steve Barr. Um, you know, there are other Red Sox affected by this who have pensions. Did you know, for example, that Joe LaHood and Bernie Carbo hmm. are, they get pensions, but they're one of the 700 guys who weren't given a cola in, in the last collective bargaining agreement. Now, <laughs> Bill, Bill is looking like, you know, I see Bill's face and he's like, why am I surprised? Why am I not surprised? I mean, how cheap can Tony Clark be? He is making $2.3 million, including his, his health benefits. Rogers is making $275,000. Winfield's making $350,000. Yet, you know, it wasn't too long ago, and Mike Port, the, the great former GM of the Red Sox and the San Diego Padres, will tell you, and by the way, he worked briefly uh, as head of MLB security, Mike Port will tell you he can remember the day that Tony Clark was, could he get a job? And he was panhandling from Manfred. Could you set me up? And Tony Clark has profited greatly from free agency. You know, I, I want in 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 the final analysis, I want people to understand where I'm coming from. I am happy. I couldn't be happier that the post 1980 players are playing during a time when TV contracts are so lucrative endorsement deals are so lucrative. Um, you know, you could put a patch on, on a cap and wear it. What, what I think is totally hypocritical is when you've got the former, I don't know where he is now, uh, the former Washington National, Seth Doolittle, he, he was where? The, the Seattle Mariners and Cincinnati Reds. I don't know where he's latched on to. But Seth Doolittle, um, you know, from his press clippings, you'd think he was the greatest guy in the world. And, you know, he, he raises money for the LGBTQA community. His uncle, yes, if the name rings a bell, was in fact Jimmy Doolittle, who wow. led who led the Doolittle raid in '45. <laughs> he won't do squat. So, you want to call people on the carpet? You start there. I mean, baseball has been very good to to people since 1980, and I'm happy for the, for all of the men who have played the game in the 42, 43 years since then. All I'm trying to impress upon them is that it is a matter of equity and people 
who didn't have the opportunities that are afforded contemporary union rank and file members should be taken care of. Do they have to? No. Legally, they don't. Morally, that's a whole different ballgame. Great way to end it, don't you think, Bill? Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Tom, as well. Hope your cousin's doing, is it your cousin? No, your nephew that's playing hockey? Oh, my my grandson, he, sc he scored our only goal. We lost two to one. So. Oh, at least he got a goal. Yeah. I suppose you know, being a Minnesota hockey guy, that the Bruins had a coach named Tom Johnson who led him to a Stanley Cup. Yeah, mm. I do. I, I, there's, a, <clears throat> there's a lot of us around. <clears throat> Um, uh, you know, when I think, when I listen to you guys talk and I, and I reflect on it, I think one of the issues is, um, maybe everybody in baseball should be required to watch Ken Burns baseball and learn a little bit of the history of the game. <clears throat> well, the sad thing is, is they seem to, you know, they, they seem to profess that they do know, and they do things like helping the Negro leaguers, which was long overdue and mm -hmm. other things, but then for some reason, on other issues, they they turn a blind eye. But it's a good point. If if this was PEDs, everybody, every journalist, like they did, would be up in arms. It's not. It's not a sexy story. It sometimes can be a complicated story. I mean, I don't think it is. But you know, I I may not be the person who can be objective about this story. Speaking of watching baseball on television, those of us in the Boston area will be able to see the first game. Oh, Northeastern tomorrow. tomorrow if, you, if you want to see the Red Sox play on the college team and a Northeastern team, as was mentioned earlier, Northeastern. Do you remember the year that the, the, the BC was actually beating the Red Sox for a few innings? Oh, it can happen. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Joe, you have a poem to wrap this up with? Yeah, Joanne. <laughs> Joanne, you're on mute. You're muting. You're muting. No, you're yeah, muting. no, I'm not. Well, I do have no, a poem. No, I don't want to. I didn't mean no, to no, no, really, I can pull something out. I don't have it right up on the screen, but, you know. That, no, it would take me too long. I had, right. There's 3,000 in the file, so <laughs> we'll leave it alone. <laughs> I'll be I'm more prepared. I was kind of like on, you know, short time uh, getting on tonight. So, um, you know, I, I came a bit unprepared for the poem part. <laughs> well, you still put together a great meeting with two great speakers. So, yeah, yep. uh, well, we'll carry on. And so good, you know, so good to see everybody here. It was great. Thank you very much. I'll I'll stop the recording and maybe a fo few folks would want to stand on stay on for one reason or another. But uh, Okay. That's Thanks,